Well, I want to welcome you to our study where we're going to undertake a look at a rather unusual topic. So bear me the introduction, which I'm calling The Mistaken Identity. And uh, it's session one of several. And we're going to focus on Revelation chapter six, the first two verses. That's our target. But before we do that, I'd like to just highlight how we're all victims of mistaken identities. It's amazing how prevalent that theme is in our literature. Alfred Hitchcock, of course, is famous for North by Northwest and a bunch of other movies that rely on that. And uh, Daphne de Maurier's classic, Scapegoat, has made it, been made into a movie, I think, four different times. Alexander Dumas, we all know the Count of Monte Cristo and the Man of the Iron Mask. He's all hanging on the idea of a mistaken identity. Charles Dickens and his Tale of Two Cities. We all remember how Sidney Carton takes Charles Darnay's place in the guillotine voluntarily. A great story. It, it, it's really more complex than most people have probably studied, but it's terrific. In more modern times, Robert Ludlum and his born identity has been made into a whole provisional set of related stories. And Dunnersmark did, has amused us all with the tourist. You can't see that without a smile on your face. It's an unusual thing. And Gilroy's du uh, movie Duplicity is so, they're so confused, they confuse themselves as to who they are. And so those are, it's a popular theme in literature. But mistaken identities also are in the real world. There are real modern examples. The most vivid one I remember is when I had an opportunity to tour Angola prison, one of the most notorious prisons on the planet Earth. And uh, it has over 5,000 inmates that are life, in there for life. And the warden, who is a, a very, very celebrated, sharp guy, uh, Burl Keynes, did a lot of innovations, but he will tell you privately that he believes half of them are innocent. They don't belong there. That's not his job. His job is to enforce the court. But it's interesting to realize there are people on death row whose parole officers said they should be freed, and they're not for some technicality. So it's astonishing to see that's real life. And more than half of them are probably innocent. Lee Harvey Oswald, we have all know that name. The cover-up of that whole episode exceeded the event itself. And then we have the reason I wear my, everybody says, Chuck, your flag is upside down. Yes, it is. Is that the most dangerous one? No. There's one that's even more dangerous than Barack Obama, believe it or not. The most dangerous mistaken identity, in my judgment, is Jesus of Nazareth. Most people have no grasp of who he is. Even Christians think they know, but they don't really. And that's what led to the autobiography that Dr. Uh, Welty and I put together. An autobiography, his own words, declares who he is and the claims he made. It's a shock to many people. I, I Jesus, an autobiography. Now, I'm going to delete that one from our list because I'm sure those of you in this audience don't have that problem. You do understand who he is. So I'll delete that from my list. I just wanted the list to be complete because I do believe that's the most dangerous of all because that affects your entire eternity. But I, so I'm going to focus this presentation what I'll call the second most dangerous mistaken identity. And it's not that one I just mentioned. It's the ultimate masquerade. The White Horseman of Revelation chapter 6. Now that may shock you as a strange choice. But the misdirection, disinformation, and deceit it involves is not going to be excelled anywhere. The white horse, and that's the primary subject of this in the next session. Now, session one will be on the white horse of, of Revelation 6. The masquerade that's involved and a summary of his career. We'll try to summarize that briefly, of course, in the coming hour. But the next session after that, we'll talk about his identity and uh, the seed of the serpent and prerequisites to his appearance. That may surprise you. 
But there are, there are some explicit prerequisites that have to be fulfilled before he can appear publicly. And so we'll deal with that. And there's also, we're going to make reference to an addendum that's going to be available about the various expectations that different groups have of what to expect of him. And each different group has a different expectation, and yet they're surprisingly similar. And that, we'll get into that too. See, man tells us that the world is getting better. That's a basic premise you find underlying most people's worldview. God says the opposite. God says they'll become increasingly worse. Ouch. That's God's vote, if you will. Man says that peace among nations is close at hand. I don't believe it for a minute, but that is the common belief that drives most of our geopolitical decisions. God says there'll be wars and rumors of wars and kingdoms against kingdoms. We'll be talking a little bit about that. That's God's promise. He's, he's going to tell us it's going to get worse and worse. Man expects to win the battle against disease, famine, and hardship. We have very committed people in the health sciences that are committed to mastering these things. But God says there's to be fearful judgments of disease, famine, and hardship. That's coming. Some people may be very uncomfortable with that. And they should be. So there is an outline in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. It's the only book of the Bible that promises you a special blessing if you read it. No other book. The other books advocate Bible reading in general. Only one book has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. And it has in the first chapter an outline of itself that many people miss. John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen. This is at the end of chapter 1. The first chapter 1, he sees the vision of Jesus Christ. So Jesus instructed, write the things which you have seen, namely that vision. Write the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta, after these things. Okay. So there's three divisions to the book. Very simple. Okay. The first is the vision of Christ in chapter 1. No problem. At the time he's writing, that's past tense. The things which are. And while he's writing, the things which exist at that time are seven churches. Seven letters to seven churches dictated, believe it or not, by Jesus himself. That most people ignore. There are things that he says he hates. And that's, those things are prevalent in virtually every church you find on the planet. And yet there are things that he expressly says he hates. Strange, isn't it? But the things which shall be hereafter. What follows after the churches? That starts at chapter 4, verse 1. So that's the division. Chapter 1, then chapter 2 and 3, the letters. And by the way, of the entire book, of its 22 chapters, the most important part of it, for you and me, is chapters 2 and 3. If you have that, you've got the kernel, as far as you and I are concerned. Why? Because all the rest is yet future. This is, that's present, that's now, that tells us what to do. But okay, but chapter, from chapter 4, verse 1 through 19, is a whole series of heavy things, okay? The things which shall be metatauta is the Greek term. It's like a marker, if you will. Metatauta, after these things. And from some of my studies, there have been some societies put together that call themselves the metatauta society, which are basically societies to study Bible prophecy. But they pick off this very thing to be their, their label, if you will. So, the things that you have seen, that's chapter 1. The things which are, the letter of seven churches. And meta, the things metatauta after these things, 4 to 19. So we're going to move into chapters 4 and 5, which will, the saints, that'll be the saints being in heaven. That'll be exciting because we'll actually be transported with John to heaven and we'll see things start to unfold. It's a time warp. It's a look ahead, if you will. It's yet future, but it's present as, as he's present while it's happening. Okay, the saints in heaven. Then we'll get through chapters 6 through 19, and that's the core of what most people think of the book of Revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ in his return here. And so that'll, be, that'll involve six seals, six trumpets, and six bowls, right? And each one of those seem to be at a logarithmic proje projection. Projection, okay? Now, we're going to focus, when I get through this overview, we're going to zero in on chapter 6. That's our target for this study and, and the few that follow. The heptatic structure. You'll notice right away, if you study the book of Revelation, there's a, seal, a scroll 
with seven seals on it, okay? And that's in chapter 6. When you get to chapter 7, you discover there's a parenthesis. There's a change of subject for a... It gets to chapter 6, changes the subject for a little bit, and then goes on to talk about 7. We discover by looking at it, there are these parenthetical passages. There's always six, a gasp for breath, so to speak, a change of subject, and then the completion. Chapter 7 comes along, and it turns out to be a, a seven trumpets. And there again, we have six of those trumpets, and then a parenthesis of some other topics that are inserted, sort of a change of subject, sort of a catch your breath, sort of like take a break kind of thing. And that's again a parenthesis. And then it goes to chapter 7, which turns out to have seven bowls of judgment. So you got seals, trumpets, and bowls. In each case, there's seven. In each case, the, after the sixth, there's a break before the seventh. And the seventh one really just consists of the next group, if you will. You follow to get the picture. That's a pattern. You realize then this book is highly structured. Highly structured. And, uh, and there, even, even in the bold, there's a, just one verse, but there's a one verse change of subject before it finishes with bold number seven, interestingly enough. So that's what they call the hepta heptatic, just the sevenfold structure of the book. And one of the things that are some, uh, some of us suspect, we don't know, we suspect that John wrote his gospel after the Patmos experience because you find his fing those haptatic fingerprints all through his gospel. It's just not as obvious. Here it's very manifest. It's almost, in fact, it's almost like a symphony. It's almost like an opera that's been organized. The gospel is, is, is uh, not quite that assertive, if you will. So we'll pick it up at chapter 4. Okay, we finished this, the, the, presumably, we finished the, the seven letters. Okay, now we're going to chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And a few verses later it's, it'll say, And there were seven lamps of fire burning in the throne. That's a strange phrase because when you read the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, the last verse of chapter 1 describe, identifies who these seven lamps are. It's the seven churches. But now in chapter 4, we find them no longer on the earth where it was in chapter 1. We find it in heaven. People miss that, but it's, very, I think, a very key indicator. I mention it as, as a footnote as we go, so you're aware of it. But the main thing here is the first phrase of chapter 4. Metatauta. After these things. That's the code word, if you will, that triggers this third major segment of the book. Are we together? Okay. And that's the very thing that, that which must be hereafter, metatauta. Those things which must be metatauta. Okay, so. So now we find ourselves with John in the throne room of the universe, flabbergasting. Now, if you're going to study throne rooms, you're going to go on to go to Isaiah 6 and uh, Ezekiel 10 and other places where we get a glimpse of the throne room. But here, this one is from Revelation 4, the throne of God. That's in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4. And in it, we find 24 elders. And there are a lot of, everything in the book of Revelation is an illusion from the Old Testament. The book of Revelation consists of 404 verses that includes over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. The reason it sounds strange to us is because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament. But it turns out that 24 elders are an illusion. We'll come back to that. But every uh, uh, idiom in the book of Revelation is explained somewhere else in the Bible. Those 24 elders will appear somewhere else in the Bible in some form. And we have the seven lamps from chapter 1. I just mentioned those. They're on a sea of glass. And I always think this is fascinating because it was a sea of glass. And the sea of glass is what we wash in when we're on the earth. It's what they're standing on it when they're in there. And I think that's, you say that's a pun. You, yes, I think it is. I think the Holy Spirit uses figures of speech, and that's one of them. And then we encounter these strange creatures, these four, your, your um, uh, English, uh, King James calls them beasts, and that's unfortunate because it's a different word. We're going to talk about beasts when we get to chapter 13, in beasts in the negative sense. The word that's used here is a different word. It's not a derogatory, it's not a frightening word. It's just, it's an alive, good kind of thing. 
the four living creatures, they turn out to be what we call the cherubim. These are super angels, and they're described. They have four faces. And those same four faces show up all through the Bible in the strangest way. The lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. In this case, it's the four faces of the cherubim. What does that mean? Well, that's, that's a whole area that you can get into if you start getting, getting mystical about the whole thing. But we'll move on. Now, the key to identity, what's going to turn out to be very important to you, is to have no con confusion about what is meant by the 24 elders. The 24 seats that are arranged, and these 24 elders come, and they worship God, and they take their crowns and put it on the glassy sea. Who are they? What do they represent? Are there really just 24, or is that just a, 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 an idiom? Probably. But who are they? Now, the only place you find 24 in the Bible is where David organizes the priesthood into 24 courses. They had, they, all the priests, were, the priests were in 24 courses, and they changed every Shabbat, and they rotated, and, and uh, they had a whole procedure. But uh, that's in 1 Chronicles 24, and 19 verses lays it out. That's the only place you'll find 24. It's got nothing to do with 12 disciples. It's got nothing to do with 12 apostles. Many people try to fabricate speculations, and that's fine. But you won't find the number 24 anywhere else. You will find it in another technical place, that there are 24 intervals. Remember when we said the 70 weeks, we know there's an interval in, chapter, in verse 26 of, of uh, Daniel 9. That interval that's there shows up surprisingly in other places in the Bible, but they're very subtle. You have to really know how to look for them. But you also discover something very interesting. I think it's interesting. There are 24 of those. 24 intervals in each case include the church. Because the church is in that interval. When you, when you get to the 24, uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel, you've got 25 to the triumphal entry. 27 is yet to happen. There's an interval there. That includes the, what we call the church age. Interesting. And that interval shows up in the biblical text 24 times. I wouldn't build our identity of 24 elders on that. I just uh, make it a footnote, uh, a, a supplemental observation. Now, there are non-Levitical priesthood uh, orders in the Bible, by the way. This is, again, a, a side thing. Melchizedek being the most startling one. That's worth study, but you need to understand it supersedes all the others. In fact, uh, Jethro had a, 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 he was a priesthood, and Jacob gives tithes in Genesis 28, and we're not sure to whom. That's interesting. But, uh, so anyway, we'll get on here. The 24 elders. Now, fortunately, they identify themselves for us. This isn't a Chuck Mistler speculation. I'm just going to call your attention to something that they say. We're going to skip over to chapter 5, verse 9. And it says, and they sung a new song, singing or saying, excuse me, quote, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. They identify who, them, who they are. They are kings and priests. By the way, they do that in chapter 1. I just, we just didn't go there to start to, when it kicks off here. But kings and priests, there are only three people in the Bible that are called kings and priests. There are some kings and the priests, but there's only three people that are both a king and a priest. Okay? The first, of course, is Melchizedek, because he's an archetype of that. The second, of course, is Jesus. He's a king and a priest. Well, who's the third? He's sitting in these seats. We are. How do I know that? All through the epistles, Paul mentions that. But here, it tells us, because thou, because thou hast redeemed us. See that us? Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and, and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God, kings and priests. And we shall reign on. So who are the 24 elders? They represent in the composite... The redeemed, what we commonly call the church, the church in the mystical sense. Somebody was asking me earlier today, what to give me an example of so, the Hebrew sod? Well, that would be one of them, I think. The concept of the ecclesia. If we use the word church, we get confused. We think of real estate. 
because we use that term in another way. If you think of the ecclesia, the, sa the saved collectively, that's interesting. Okay, well, let's get back to chapter 5 at the beginning, starting chapter verse 1. John says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I just noticed, by the way, for the first time as I was looking at the little title slide I often use, you've seen me with that little scroll. If you look at it closely, it's written within and on the backside, which means it's a title deed. But we'll go on here. And John says, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? That call goes out, okay? And it says, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look thereon. Wow. Now you and I are puzzled what's going on. We're wondering what's going on. John understood. Why? How do I know? Because the next line says, John says, I sobbed convulsively. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll, neither to look thereon. Wow. You see, there's a subtlety here that was required that we don't pick up on, okay? It had to be a man. It had to be a kinsman of Adam to be eligible. And no man was found worthy. And John realized the desperate situation of that. You and I miss it because you don't have the background. John, John understood. He says, I sobbed convulsively. Why? Because no man was found worthy. Fortunately, there's an exception that's going to point, be pointed out to him. But that's the, gen that's, that's the predicament. Are we together? Okay. It's interesting how when he's up there in heaven and there's something on the earth that needs explanation, the elders explain it to him. Excuse, no, excuse me. If it's on the earth, the cherubim explain it to him. If there's something going on in heaven he doesn't understand, the elders explain it to him. You'll notice it's always a, some cases it's an elder explaining, other cases it's an, you know, a cherubim explaining. Anyway. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not! Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So John's obviously relieved. He turns and he looks. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb as it had been slain. Wow. He was told it was a lion, root of David. No, no, he turns and looks, it's not a lion, it's a lamb. Because the idiom goes to the very title that John the Baptist used when in the first public appearance of Christ by the Jordan. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Jewish title. And that's the title used here. So the Lamb has been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes. That's an idiom for the Holy Spirit which are the seven spirits of God sent forth. It's interesting how the seven spirits, it draws from Isaiah 11 again and again. The seven spirits are a way of referring to what you and I summarize as the Holy Spirit, as a person. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, that's his expectation. He turns and sees the lambs that had been slain. Wow. A couple of things to highlight that I want you to carry away in your notes. The 24 elders are in heaven worshiping the Lamb before he receives the scroll. Understand that? They're there before the scroll is given. Okay? It's when the, the Lamb has the, and he has the unique right to open it. And by the way, if he's the one opening the scroll, he's not one of the seals. <laughs> you follow me? I'll get to that in a minute. But his opening the seals, uh, it's, it's opening, his opening of the seals, that sets the four horsemen into motion. So understand those four horsemen are set in motion after we are in heaven. It's astonishing how many people stumble over that. They don't get it. It's pretty straightforward and fundamental. Okay, the opening of the seven is the seal of gold. Okay, so Verse 1, it says, and I saw the Lamb when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts, uh, actually one of the four living creatures is what it should say, it's one of the cherubim, uh, said, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, 
And he that sat on him had a bowl, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Okay, good. So that's the first of the four seals. Are we together so far? We'll read the through just to get the flavor of the next one here. The second seal is the red horse, which represents wars. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Wow. So that's the second one, the red horse. And then the third one's the black horse, which speaks of famine and, and uh, uh, inflation. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, measuring something here. And black is often connected with famine, of course. To eat bread by weight is an indictment from Leviticus 26 and other places. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Scarcity, famine, that's the overtone. There's more, but we'll get into that when the time comes. Okay, so we have white, red, and black. There's one more to come here. The livid horse, the pale horse. The actual word in the Greek implies chloros. It means green, but it's an a, a ugly kind of green. Speaking of death, naturally. And when he'd opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed after him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And those beasts are not necessarily four-footed. They can be microscopic. But they're beasts nonetheless. So that's the fourth one. Okay. Ezekiel 14, we have an interesting verse. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, the pestilence, and cut off from it man and beast. Wow. There's something else I'd like to highlight, sort of in the, we're just this sort of the warm-up. We'll get to the one we're really after in a minute. But it's interesting to contrast Revelation 6, the whole bunch, and Matthew 24. In Revelation 6, you have the white horse and rider. You have a red horse when you war. You've got the black horse for famine. You've got pale horse for death. You'll have the martyrs that will follow. And then you have the worldwide chaos that comes at next. It's interesting, Matthew 24, you have false Christ to begin with. You've got wars, famines, death, martyrs, and worldwide chaos in the same order. You notice that. There's a parallelism that's, I suspect, deliberate. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's designed that way. Now, there's another thing I'll call your attention to that may just be a coincidence, but it's still too curious not to mention it to you. The white, red, black, and green are on all the flags of Islam. What do you do with that? I don't know. I wouldn't make too much of it, but it's too curious not to make you at least aware of it for what it's worth. The heptatic structure. Got a seven seal scroll with, and you've got the seven trumpets, again with each one with a parenthesis, and the seven bowls of judgment. Okay, fair enough. So that's it. we're going to zero in, of course, on the uh, four seals: white, red, black, and green. The four horsemen. In fact, what really has brought us together? That's this was all sort of a warm up. We are going to look at, behold, the white horse. And it may surprise you that I regard him as the mistaken identity. It astonishes me to see how many commentators miss the whole point of what he's all about. Why a white horse? John 5.43 says, Jesus said to them, in John chapter 5, verse 4, 43, he says, I have come in my Father's name, you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. You're going to make a mistake, in other words. A mistaken identity. See, this rider of this white horse is not Christ. How do I know? 
Well, first of all, he's in bad company. Look at the three guys riding with him. That's not Christ. Furthermore, Christ's the one that's opening the seals. He's not a subject of one of the seals. But this guy that's coming will resemble and imitate Christ. That's the point. And he does it so well that there are many commentators that don't pick up on it. They also fooled. Furthermore, this one is called forth by the living creatures. That's not appropriate for them to call Christ forward. He's their creator. No, no. So, and there's going to be a lot said about his career. We'll get into that here shortly. So back to, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures said, come and see. That's not quite what he said. He actually said, proceed. Your King James called it come. Erku in the Greek is actually at, at uh, uh, call forth. He's ordered by one of the four living creatures. And remember, Jesus is the one opening the seals in the first place. Behold, a white horse. Why a horse? We've got all these horses. Horses are often used to designate judgments, like a force or like a tithe, in a sense. And there's lots of examples in your notes. You can track those down and come to your own conclusions. But here, the, apparently, one of his key characteristics is that he had a bow. Of all the things to mention, that's singled out. Two things are mentioned, a bow and a crown, but the bow is mentioned. And most people jump to the conclusion that that's an archery term. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. A bow versus a sword, for an example. The Hebrew is kesheth. In the Greek translation, it's a toxon, which is a bow. And it's not necessarily a tool of archery. That's a very common presumption. It's understandable. But there's something else you need to be aware of that exegetes will highlight to you, and that's what's called the law of first mention. When something is mentioned the first time in the Bible, it turns out to be significant and it has a unique relevance. Let's take a look at those. Law of first mention. The word love. Where's the first place that the word love appears? God uses to Abraham about his son. Because his son is going to be acting out a type of God's son. Because another father is going to offer his son. And that's what Abraham is going to act out, in effect. And he knows he is, by the way. He knows he's acting out prophecy because he names the place prophetically. And Hebrews 11, 19 highlights that. So that's love as an example. The first place love shows is where it's referring to the, the Son of God and in the context of giving himself to all of us. Wow. What could be more appropriate? The word man, okay, and uh, is that made, man was made in the image of God. First place man appears is where he's being made in the image of God. Is that relevant? I sure think so. Well, what about this bow business? Well, in chapter 9, verse 13 is the first mention of it. God says, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. See, you and I don't associate it as a token of a covenant. God does several times. It's a token of a covenant. How interesting it is as we really begin to understand the white horseman, the key event in his life is making a covenant that gets him to power and then breaking it. That's going to be a major element of his career we'll get into. The, bow, the, the covenant and its breaking is a, is a key identity for him. And we'll see that go. Amos 2.15, Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow, and he that is shift to foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. Interesting little allusions here you find when you're watching for them. Okay? And so, the bow. See, the bow seems to symbolize... In addition, the first world leader, which was Nimrod, the hunter, it was a symbol, apparently, and also the final world leader will be, have the same symbol. He's also an Assyrian. So the, both the first and last Assyrian seem to be identified together. But when we get to Daniel chapter 9, probably one of the most important, the last four verses of Daniel 9 is what Jesus points his disciples to when they ask him about the end times. In the Mount of Olives, four guys came to him, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Peter's brother. They come and they ask him some questions, and he gives them a briefing, which we call the Olivet Discourse, because it's on the Mount of Olives at night, but that's no big deal, per se, just a label. 
But in those four verses, the last verse talks about a week of years. That's pivotal. And it says, He shall confirm the covenant with the many for one week. The last week of years. It's the, se- it's the 70th week of a group of 70. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, this isn't the place to try to unravel the whole 70 weeks. But if you haven't done it, you need to desperately really understand the 70 week prophet, the last four verses of Daniel 9. And that's a study in its own right. I'm assuming that's a review for, for most of you. But this leader, this world leader, is going to achieve power because he's going to eventually be able to enforce the covenant or confirm the covenant with Israel. The many is an idiom there of Israel. He shall enforce the covenant with the many for one week. Okay? That's his commitment. Except, you see, that, that by the way, it, it appears to involve temple sacrifice and so forth, as we'll see in a minute. But in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So whatever that covenant includes, it may be a lot of other things too. But we know it apparently includes their permission to re, re, uh, return to sacrifice their, their uh, Jewish, Jewish uh, sacraments. In the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. So in the middle of the week, these are weeks of years. He abrogates that covenant. That's a big deal in his life. Jesus is going to point to that when we get to Matthew. Jesus is going to make a big thing of that. We'll get there in a minute. He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So his enforcement of the covenant seems to include a return to the temple sacrifices for some weird reason. And for the overspreading, and that's what we call the abomination of desolation. That's a term that Jesus used. We'll see in just a minute. Abomination is a form of idol worship. And the extreme version of that is to put an idol in the most sacred place on the planet Earth. In the temple, in fact, in the Holy of Holies. And we know that because there was a historical event that Jesus makes reference to in using that term. And so, this is the very marker that Jesus calls the attention of the disciples to in the Olivet Discourse. The abomination. So we'll get to that. Let's take a look at it. When you get to uh, Matthew 24, there's a whole bunch of things that are mentioned before you get to verse 15. Wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and divers, all those things. He says, but the end is not yet. Those things are lumped and then described as not being signs. Strange. We always list, see those in lists of signs. No, he lists those things that they're coming, but they're not signs because they're not distinctive enough to be a sign. However, when you get to verse 15, he says, by then he says these things are not, are not signs. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, which one? Spoken of by Daniel the prophet. He's talking about chapter 9, right here. Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Wow, there's a lot in this little, this one verse is a big deal. We could spend an hour on this little verse. Okay. The, uh, you've got all these critics that like to argue who really wrote Daniel. I know who wrote Daniel. How do I know? Jesus told me. Daniel the prophet. Anybody that wants to challenge has got bigger problems than the authorship of Daniel. And when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand where? In the holy place. In fact, the holy of holies is where it is. And then he adds this little phrase, whoso readeth, let him understand. How many of you read that with me just now? Can I see a show of hands? Do you realize you just picked up an obligation? Jesus said, whoso readeth, let him understand. You now do not have the option of not bringing that to understanding. You need to dig into that till you understand it. Because Jesus tells you to. That's not a little peripheral thing that you know, good, good people have different views about. No, that's something that you need to understand. Jesus says so. Okay? It's the key event in the Olivet Discourse. The abom- that abomination, that, that event, the putting up of an idol in the Holy of Holies is what it's talking about, is going to puncture that 70th week right in the middle. There were seven years set aside by the world leader that's going to be violated. He's, going to not, he's not going to keep his covenant. He's going to violate that covenant. That's exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did back in 167 B.C. That very thing. He made a covenant and he violated it right in the middle. The pattern was there. 
And by the way, see, this is no longer optional. You've got to do your homework now. Okay? But there's something else here. Did you realize that there's a technology statement in here? I want you to be alert to technology statements. I'm sure if Dwayne Madsen was among us, he would insist, as he's our, he's our enterprise architect, and he would insist that we always pay attention where there's evidences of design. Well, there's a technology statement here. Do you see it? When you therefore shall uh, see the abomination, how can you see something that's in the Holy of Holies? If you're in the mountains of Judea, or you're by the Sea of Galilee, or wherever you are, how can you see an event that's going on inside the Holy of Holies. You can only enter the Holy of Holies once a year, if you're, only if you're the high priest, only once a year, and after great ceremonial preparation. No one's allowed in there. But apparently, when ye therefore shall see this thing happen, how are you going to see it? Anyone? On CNN or BBC. It's going to be televised. It's a big, it's a big event. Apparently, it's going to get public attention. And when you see that happen, oh boy, you get some instructions to follow here. What do you do? Then let them which be in Judea, not in the holy place, them which be in Judea, flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Realize the housetop was typically the guard, it was on a, a, on a hillside. So often your roof is at street level. So if you're leaving, you know, you leave from the roof, strangely. He that's on the housetop, not come down to take anything out of his house. The missile translation is, you split and you split now. Okay. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. That tells you something about his audience. He's assuming his audience is Jewish. If it was Sabbath day, it wouldn't bother us. No, he's assuming he's talking to Jews. It's talking to Jews. Luke 21 is not. That's during the day in the temple. It's a different, very similar, but very different presentation with a different conclusion. Many people think Luke 21 is part of the Olive Discourse. No, 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 no. But let's move on here. For then shall, Jesus, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. He's quoting from Daniel 12, actually. But he is labeling the last half of that seven-year period. It's split in the middle by the abomination of desolation. Three and a half years before, three and a half years after. He labels the last half the great tribulation. Where does it get that label? From Jesus here in Matthew um, 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever would shall be. You mean to tell me it's going to be worse than the Nazi Holocaust? Absolutely. By a factor of two to one. How do I say that? The first Holocaust, of world, we know of from World War II, took apparently about one Jew in three. About one third of Jewry perished in, in the so-called Holocaust. Zechariah 13.9 says the next one will take two out of three. And because I read that on the radio, the Anti-Defamation League has labeled me an anti-Semite. I think they've corrected that. By, I think they've got enough mail that straightened that out. But in any case, not on the Sabbath day. He's speaking to a Jewish audience. And the Great Tribulation, he labels the last half, the three and a half years, the 42 months, the 12th. Each half is labeled every way you could think of. Half a week, three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. The Holy Spirit did everything but put it in nanoseconds for you. And then you get to verse 22. This is another one that I just don't want you to miss. Jesus says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Do you realize that's a technology statement? If we were studying this, say, in 1860, roughly the time of the Civil War in the United States, if we were at that period studying this, would we understand this? Probably not. We could not imagine the world wiping itself out with muskets and bayonets. No, this is a technology statement that says it'll be in our capability of wiping us totally out. 
Except those days be short, there should no flesh be saved. That's a technology statement. And we today, you know, the, the nuclear cloud hangs over every geopolitical decision made on the planet Earth. The reality of that. Back in the days of mutually assured destruction, we had two players, the U.S. and Russia. The nightmare scenario in those days was what we used to call the nth country problem. What happens when there's more than two, three, four, there's a plurality. That was regarded as a nightmare because that's a study of coalitions and what have you. And uh, that's where we are today. There are a number of countries that have nuclear weapons, not just Russia and the U.S. Every, there's a number of them. You, whether it's five or eight, you can argue. I won't get into that here. We'll talk about that next time. And Jesus says, he goes on to say, Then if any man should say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, or there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wow. 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 There shall arise false Christs. Even if he's riding a white horse, don't get confused, okay? <laughs> the heptatic structure. Behold a white horse. Let's take a closer look at him. And I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and the crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. A crown was given to him. What kind of crown? There's two words in the Greek. A diadem or a Stephanos? Here we have Stephanos. That's a victor's crown. That's like an a, a, a athletic award kind of thing. And a, a wreath or garland given as a prize to victors at public games. It's like an ornament. It's to honor somebody. That's what a Stephanos is. That's what we're talking about here. It's that kind of crown that is given to him. And yet, it's a, this is not a diadem. A diadem is a crown that implies rulership, authority. Okay? Like a sovereign reigning over. Okay? Conquering and to conquer. And the word there is nikeo, meaning to rule over. To get the victory or conquer or prevail over. So despite the fact that it's a ward of that kind... It apparently propels him into a position of power. It's interesting to understand that. Well, that's exactly what Daniel tells us back in Daniel 8. Speaking of him, in effect, it says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken without hand. There's an illusion there. By peace he shall destroy many. He's a peacemaker, but he uses that to gain power. He then becomes very powerful, militarily strong. He doesn't get there through military strength. His military strength derives from the position of power he maneuvers. Important to understand that. His career begins as a peacemaker, and it's highlighted, it's highlighted by the covenant with Israel. He gets strong enough to enforce that covenant. Okay? That's something else that's usually overlooked by people making little charts. There's a duration of time from the time that he is first appears until he's powerful enough to start the 70th week of Daniel. He can't be revealed until the rapture takes place. And 2 Thessalonians 2 will deal with that. We'll get to that later. But... Um, Anyway, we'll move on here. See, the writer is indeed the prince that shall come. That's one of his many titles. Okay. In the Old Testament, you can actually find 33 potential titles of this character. Some of them, when used connotatively, speak of just evil in general. But when they're used denotatively, are talking about a person. And many of these are, were indebted to um, Arthur Pink for the... Uh, uh, discovery, but seed of the serpent in Genesis 3.15 is clearly one of them. The idol shepherd in Zechariah 11, we'll talk more about that later. He's a shepherd, but he's an idol worshiper. And uh, the little horn of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 are allusions to him. The prince that shall come is one of his titles in Daniel 9, uh, the 70 week prophecy. He's called the willful king in Daniel 11, and there's a whole history of his family tree in that one. Now, in the New Testament, now there's 33 titles in the Old Testament, potential titles, and the New Testament is 13. We won't go all through all of them. I won't drag you through all of those. But the first is the beast that you find out. First mentioned in Revelation 11 and widely discussed in Revelation 13, the beast. And there's a second beast that we tend to call from that point on the false prophet. 
One of the things to keep in mind, there's not one guy, there's a duet. There's two guys. One will call the beast, the other one will call the false prophet. Okay? Some, some people call him the Antichrist. Antichristo in the Greek is actually a pseudo-Christ. The fact that he's against Christ isn't the point. He's in the place of Christ. But I'll tell you what's wrong with that label. We, don't need, we shouldn't try to fight it, because that's what everybody calls him by usage. But the truth of the matter is, it's probably an error. Because the only guy that uses the word Antichrist is John in his epistles. And he uses the term in a different way, in a spiritual sense, not as an individual per se. And so John is the only one that uses that phrase. And John, in the book of Revelation, doesn't use that term for him. He has several others he uses instead. So it's, in a sense, it's an unfortunate label, but it's the one everybody uses, so let's, why fight it? Okay. He's called the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians. He's called the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians. He's the one that comes in his own name, according to Jesus' remark in John 5, 43. And uh, he's called the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2. He's called that in such a way that some people, I don't happen to agree with this, so I don't want to confuse you, but there are some that feel that he might be the reincarnation of, of Judas. I don't think so for a lot of reasons, but they tie it because of that use of that peculiar phrase. Okay. What are some of his characteristics? He's obviously an intellectual genius. No question about that. He's a bright guy. Okay. He's a persuasive orator. Okay. He's a shrewd politician. Obviously, that's how he rises to power. He's a financial genius, indeed. And he turns out to be a forceful military leader. There are references you can track these things down on your own. He's a very powerful organizer, and he's also a unifying religious guru. He manages to get the world to, he managed to get himself to be um, above all that is called God. That's the phrase out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He elevates himself above all that is called God. That includes Allah. Is he a Muslim? He's more than that. He's found a way to unify whatever, wherever you come from to worship him. So is he a Muslim? Probably that with the decimal point moved over, move over. See? Now there is only one physical description of him in the Bible that I'm aware of. We find it in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. Where Zechariah has one of, these, one of these little tidbits he throws at us. Woe to the idol shepherd. Idol like a false, something that's falsely worshipped. Woe to a, to the, not idol like lazy, idol like false worship. You with me? Okay. Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. But apparently he does have a physical defect. In fact, maybe that's why people who want to demonstrate an allegiance to him receive a mark on their forehead and on their right hand to, to, to allude to this, his peculiar disfigurement. It's possible he has these disfigurements or whatever because of his healing from the head wound. Okay, that's a speculation. We don't know. Okay. But in Revelation 13, 3, we notice, it says, And one of his heads were, as it were, wounded to the death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. In other words, apparently it's an event that is very, very, uh, um, sort of a trademark kind of thing. His deadly wound was healed. Again in chapter 13, but down at verse 12 and 13, it says, And he exercised all the power of the first. Bear in mind, it's talking about the second of the two guys. Remember, there's two guys. The first guy is the political one. The second one is the, we call him the false prophet. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. It's the first beast that has the head wound. You follow me? It's the second beast that causes the people to worship the guy with the head wound. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wow! His deadly wound was healed. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, 
that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And that goes on to the 666, and I want to get that here. That's a whole other thing. But I want you to just be sensitive that there are two guys. It's a duet. A political leader, which we'll call the first beast, and the false prophet who forces everyone to worship the first beast. You with me? It's a duet. Okay. In fact, some people like to visualize Satan as the third, so it's a, a, sat a satanic trinity, so to speak. Okay. Which had this had the wound by so this head wound is a is a trademark, okay? And so so the uh, but there's a that's not his primary if I was going to pick an identity, I would not pick his head wound. I could use that because everybody's familiar with it, but there's another identity that I'm fond of using with this guy. I call him Mr. Big Mouth. Because it's astonishing how many verses you can find where he is shooting off his mouth. Bragging, uh, so forth. Daniel 7, 8 is one of those examples. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, the one I mentioned, exalting himself above all that is called God. Think about that one. Revelation 13, 5. And there's a lot of others too. You can find your own. But you'll discover every time he's, more often than anything else mentioned about him, is he's shooting off his mouth. He's bragging, boasting. He's Mr. Arrogance. Okay. So in our next session, we're going to talk about his identity. We've talked about his career. His career. One of the questions you may have, is he alive today? A lot of people ask me that. And I always say, absolutely. They look at me startled. Then I quickly point out, if you asked me that a hundred years ago, I'd say, absolutely. Because I have this theory that Satan has always had to have his man in the wings. Because he doesn't know when the starting gun is going to be fired, when the harpazza takes place. That's a whole other thing we'll get into. Is he a Jew or a Gentile? There are good arguments both ways. You can make arguments that he was Je he's Jewish. Because he's accepted by Israel in some, in some respects. Then again, not so. So that's another. But remember, there's two guys, so that makes it more complicated. Will he be an alien? It may surprise you to find scriptural evidence that he probably is. Well, look at Daniel 2.43 as an example. Speaking of a group that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That means that they must be something other than the seed of men. What does that mean? We'll talk about that next time. Is there a genealogical link from the seed of Satan? We know that the seed of the woman is a title of Jesus. The seed of the serpent is a title of this imposter. Is there a genealogical story behind that? Possibly. We'll take a look at that. We'll also discover that there are various expect every group has a different expectation. The Muslims have their view of what's going to happen regarding him. The Vatican, it may shock you to discover, the Vatican is preparing to receive someone of extraterrestrial origin as that guy. They have the best astronomers and the fanciest facilities in southeastern in, in the world in southeastern Arizona. And they are preparing to receive an alien visitor. You've got to be kidding. No, we're quite serious. And what about the transhumanists? They have their agenda. Whole other scenario where they believe they're only a couple of years away from immortality. Not decades, years, not far away. Really. And what about the Freemasons? Boy, they have a story. So there's a number of those. The real question that lurks behind all is, should we be concerned? What do we care? And there's lots of reasons you don't have to care, and I'll take, take, care, take you through that next time. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you that we serve the, <laughs> the fifth rider, our precious Lord. We look for our horseman, that one that will put all this behind us. We thank you, Father, for who you are. We thank you for the extremes you've gone to on our behalf. And we thank you for your word, Father, these things that you've chosen to reveal to us. And we pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and that word, that you would reveal to each of us what you would have of us in the days ahead, that we might be ever more effective for you in all these things as we commit our way without reservation of any kind. We commit our way into your hands in the name of Yeshua our coming King, 
indeed, our kinsman redeemer himself. Amen.